Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to Extreme Hangout and Sport for Climate Action in partnership with Think Beyond. We've got something particularly special um, now coming up. There have been few activists that have taken such dramatic steps to draw attention to the peril of our oceans. And what we'll see over the course of the next hour um, is a fraction of the effort that Lewis Pugh, the UN patron of the ocean, puts in to his activism. The planning delivery of these swims, the politics, the horse trading that goes on behind the scenes. He doesn't just put his body on the line, he's put his life into ocean protection and climbing change. Let's look at the latest, uh, well the last, second last big adventure that Lewis was on in the Antarctica um, and the movie On the Edge, and we're delighted to have the uh, director here with us as well, uh, Michael Booth. But let's have a quick look at On the Edge. getting out at the end of that swim and looking down at my hands and my hands were were swollen they were completely frozen solid I couldn't bend my fingers the pain was absolutely excruciating and at that moment I thought to myself how many more years have you got in you to do this type of stuff how many more years there's a price which you pay yeah as a price. My motivation is very, very simple. I've been swimming for over 30 years. I've seen the oceans change and I'm passionate about trying to protect these last wilderness areas on this earth. These areas are so, so special. I remember a few days ago when I was down there by the emperor penguins, and you just see how harsh their life is. Over 30% of the little baby penguins, they die in the first year, and they just don't need the additional pressures which humans put on top of them because of climate change and also because of this massive industrial overfishing which takes place here in the Southern Ocean. For years, he has been swimming in the freezing waters of the Arctic and the Antarctic to call the attention of the world to the plight of both the North and the South Pole. Yeah, it's Lewis. He's uh, my hero. He's gonna protect this uh, continent. And for me, it's, I'm so happy to come here because it's, uh, it's in Russia we say it's better one time to see than a hundred times to hear. Some people say that uh, oh, Lewis has got loads of experience. This isn't hard for him. He doesn't get cold. He's superhuman. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I've been swimming now for the past six months preparing for this swim. Freezing cold many, many days. It's hard. In the moments before a swim, it's absolutely crucial that one, that one is psyched up, but is not psyched out, okay? And you've got to really, really focus and just get your mind ready. Uh, because these swims are so dangerous, because I'm now going to be swimming through a tunnel with ice on top of me, in water which is about zero degrees, and ice which can fall down, and moulons which can suck you, straight the way down to the, to the bottom, you know, hundreds of meters down to the, to the bedrock. And so it's crucial that 
I calm my mind down and then just remember I've done the training, the safety's in place, but now you've got to commit and you've got to commit 100%. And that's the thing about swimming in a tunnel, especially when there's a river through a tunnel, and that is that once you've started, you've then got to go through. And it's this power of, of a made-up mind. And I'm starting here, I'm going through the tunnel, and I'm getting all the way to the end. And nothing is going to stop me from getting there. There was one moment, there was one moment of great tension and utter fear and terror during that swim. I was going through the tunnel, I was about halfway through, and then from above, I heard this almighty boom. It was like somebody had, had fired a cannon straight the way through. And I looked up and I thought to myself, no, please, no, no. I thought, is this whole thing gonna come piling down on top of me? And uh, luckily nothing happened. And <laughs> I swam those last few meters through that tunnel as quickly as I could. I have never, ever been so happy to see the light at the end of the tunnel. To be next to him yesterday, see the way in which he gets into these freezing waters only in his bathing suit is nothing short of science fiction. And everybody uh, ready right now to, to get together as a big team to, to fight against climate change for one reason, for the future life on the planet. I can assure you about one thing, and that is that my determination to protect this part of the world is far stronger than the indifference of any political leaders. I will stand and I will fight for this place, whatever the cost, whatever the cost. He's known as the human polar bear, who as Pew has been swimming in Arctic temperatures for years now. Uh, please welcome Lewis Pugh. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Uh, so, welcome Lewis. We are truly honoured to have you here. And um, just, I've, I've known you for a long time, but every time I see something like that, I am completely moved by the human endeavour and that, that power of a made-up made mind that you've spoken about. Um, what does it take to be the first human being um, to swim under the Antarctic ice sheet? And number one, the, the, that water shouldn't necessarily be there as well, I think is the first point to say. But what does it take to be that first human being? Small question to start. <laughs> well, I think if you're gonna be a pioneer, you have gotta be really focused and you've got to go for it. But you, if you knew how hard it was going to be, you probably wouldn't have done it. So in retrospect, that swim was, was so incredibly dangerous. So when you're going down that tunnel and you think of all the consequences which could happen as a result of going down that tunnel, if I look at it now, I probably wouldn't do it. And you, I mean, you talk about a cost. Mm. You know, there's a cost there. It's, um, so what has the cost been to you? When you've been... Re there's a lot of feedback. Is when, you, um, when you've been really, really, really cold, you never quite warm up. It's deep in your bones, and you remember it. And even watching that video now, I was cold deep down inside my bones. Yeah, I was thinking about that muscle mm. memory and yeah. the fear. So, th assumably, the more you go into these situations, the more you don't want to go into these situations. This sport is the only sport where the more experience you have, yeah. the harder it becomes. So, most sports with more experience, you can become better at them. But this is a, the complete opposite, and that is because when you've been really, really cold, 
you never warm up. And so every single subsequent swim which you do is exponentially harder than the previous one because you've got to mm. forget about the previous one in order to get there. And is, uh, you've taken it uh, in, in very deep very early. Is there, any, <laughs> is there anything, any particular pain that you have this, you must have a, a bit of a, is there any particular pain that you have a particular memory about? Oh, yeah. My hands. Your hands. Yeah. It is when you go into water below zero or even close to zero, the pain in the hands and in the fingers is, is, is extreme and it, and it just ratchets us up. So I'd just come back from Greenland where I was doing a swim and on some days the water was three degrees and some days it was zero. And you think, okay, what's the difference between zero and three degrees? It's nothing. <laughs> Every single degree you go down ratchets up the pain exponentially. And when you go below zero, when you go down to minus 1.7 degrees, that is that the, you realize you're absolutely in a death zone. But the most extreme scenario is when you go, for example, I swam in the Ross Sea, where the water temperature is minus 1.7, but the air temperature was minus 27. Wow. So the water was hitting up against the side of the boat, and the, the splash would then turn into ice mid-air and go straight into the boat. Wow. Mm. So Assume, have you got fillings? Uh, Assumably they must have hurt a little bit. Sorry, weird question. Sorry, Abraham. <laughs> I don't know how I've gotten to dentistry so early in an interview with you and Patron of the Oceans. It's Assumably it, when you breathe in, that must hurt. It, it's just such a physical assault on your body. Uh, it's, so you'll never get any pair of goggles in the world that will be able to withstand that. So immediately they, they, they freeze up so you can't see. Uh, all you're hearing is a noise, and which you're very much inside your head, your hands, you can't feel. It's massive sensory deprivation, but it's also a sensory overload because you're, there is so much fear. I, I, I'm trying to give everyone an idea of what you put yourself through because mm. your, ac your activism is in direct correlation to what you do yeah. and the cost you pay for it. So um, it's one more question about your body. Um, I swim in reasonably cold water occasionally, about eight degrees, yeah. and I get headaches the moment I put my head in. Yes. What happens to your head in these sort of temperatures? Are you not in agony? I, I'm in agony from my toes to my <laughs> top of my head. You don't know what's hurting. Everything is hurting. Okay. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Well, I, I just wanted to give some context there to, to because you you're not a superhuman being. You're a human being. You don't have some special qualities that allows you to do these things that are death-defying, really? So I've been swimming now for 35 years, and of those 35 years, 18 have been spent in the polar regions. Yeah. So the only reason why I'm able to withstand those colds is probably because I've been spending more time than anybody else. And then I asked this other question. Um, when we look outside this boat, would you get in the Clyde? You're quite <laughs> probably happy to be floating on this river rather than in this river at the moment. Have you looked out the back there? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's utterly filthy. I've done uh, a few river swims in my life, and every single major river swim I've done, I've got sick. Yeah. Our rivers, not only here in the United Kingdom, but worldwide now, we have a massive problem. We're using them as sewers. Yeah, I mean, the UK government, I think there was, there was 12 votes for a change in the law now. I think that's shifted now under a bit of weight of public attention. But what did you make of um, the idea that we could keep polluting our waters with... with reasonable freedom and with no retribution. It's ecocide, period, it's ecocide. We are damaging the most precious thing that we have, which is water. And when you come like my, myself from Cape Town, where just two, three years ago, we were very, very close to running out of water. We were just a few days away from a city of five million people running out of water. And then you see the way people treat water and treat our rivers, it's criminal. So just going back that to the swim and, and what we've just seen um, on the edge, the hard work begins afterwards, I assume, because you then use the platform for the exposure um, to then do what? What, what happens next after that? Because well, li li literally five days after that swim, I was in the Kremlin with uh, Putin's number two, Sergei Ivanov, yeah. trying to get that area of Antarctica properly protected. And... Uh, we were so close. It was the first time that I you know, sat down with him and there was a real acknowledgement about how serious the climate crisis is and that we all needed to do something about it. And then a week later, the pandemic. Mm. 
uh, really kicked off and everything was closed. And I think that's been the real price of this pandemic, you know, which has been that trying to get international agreements across the line, trying to get negotiations across the line uh, has been exponentially more difficult. Yes, you can do a lot on Zoom, and yes, we must work uh, virtually as much as possible, and we must reduce our flights. But I can tell you something, that when you're trying to get a, a negotiation with the Russian government across the line, you actually have to look at them straight in the face, and you have to get that agreement, and you need that face time. And you need to talk to them person to person, man to man. And assumably... Rus Russians particularly have admiration for your cold swim. It, it, it's a bit of a cultural piece there that works in your favour. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so in, in Russia, cold water swimming is a language which everybody understands. There's nobody in Russia who hasn't gone for a swim in a lake or a river or uh, in, in winter. So um, and, and you must think about Russia. So Russia is the biggest nation in the world. It's twice as big as the second biggest nation in the, in the world. It owns half the Arctic. And by a, a uh, as a result of international law, it controls the Southern Ocean as well. Mm -hmm. So it's an Arctic and an Antarctic nation. They see themselves like that. They see themselves as a polar nation. People love and respect the cold. Uh, and so you must be it must be you must be reasonably crestfallen that they're not present here, and you know making a contribution uh, dramatically to, to what's going on here. Well, I mean, the Russian delegation yeah. will be here. Yeah. Sure, President Putin is, isn't here. Yeah. Xi Jinping isn't here. Cyril Ramaphosa isn't here. Yeah. And it would be wonderful to have them because if you start thinking about it, Russia, as I say, is the biggest nation in the world. It's an energy superpower. Mm. You think about China, it's the most populous nation in the world. Uh, you think about South Africa, which is just driving, as, using as much coal as possible. These nations, I would, have, I would have hoped that they would be here. But let's also bear in mind, 120 heads of state mm. have come here. That's more than any other COP I've been to. So things are moving, and they're moving in the right direction. But the Russian delegation will be here. The Chinese delegation will be here. These are two powerful countries. They'll have sent the, their top diplomats here. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about COP and your expectations a little later on. I want to go back to... So you had a huge success in protecting the Ross Sea. Mm. I'd love you to say, what was the difference... Uh, was the difference between getting Russia over the line purely down to the fact that COVID hit and people were distracted. So what, what worked the first time when you managed to protect the Ross, T Ross Sea? And what was amiss that second time round? Yeah. I think the first time President Obama was in his final uh, term. And it was America and New Zealand that had proposed this marine protected area. And in a sense, that's one of the problems. So when you have a big superpower like America proposing it, then trying to get the other nations like Russia and China across the line, I think is more difficult. Mm. You need to get countries, let's say like South Africa and Namibia, proposing them, and then there's mm. perhaps less opposition. Anyway, it was America that had proposed it. Obama was in his final term, and he wanted to get this area protected. And he had John Kerry, who... I have the greatest respect for who shuttled backwards and forwards to China to get it across the line. So that unlocked the Chinese side. And once China agreed to it, then it was the last country was Russia. So we had to get 25 nations plus the EU across the line. And when it came to Russia, the key to unlocking it was Slava Fetisov. You saw him on that video. So just to explain who Slava is, Slava is a Russian ice hockey legend he would be to Russia what Muhammad Ali would have been to America, what Pele would have been to, uh, to Brazil. He is that big. Uh, he'd won two Olympic gold medals. He supersedes sport, and uh, he had access to the highest authority. And I went to meet him in Moscow, so straight after that Ross Sea swim, and he said something simple to me. He said, because he had been a defense man in ice hockey, and he said, the world needs more defenders and protectors. And then he started taking me around all the different ministers, everybody that would have to sign it off. And it wasn't a fast process. I thought that I could get it across the line in maybe six months. No, it was, I had to go to Russia and to Washington a number of different times. And then he took me to all the key decision makers. 
And then finally, uh, three years ago, everybody met down, uh, four years ago, everyone met down in, in, in uh, Hobart in Australia. And then I just got a text message from Slava. It was very, very simple. And he said, we're going to sign the deal. And uh, Amazing. It's, the, it's three times the size of... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's huge. It, it was the happiest day of my life. Because this area is so important. I mean, when you go down to the Ross Sea and you, and, 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 and you see these uh, emperor penguins tobogganing across the ice and you see the great big whales, and the, it, it, it's a place of amazing beauty. But the great big industrial fishing fleets were, you know, were, were going in there and, and hoovering up the Antarctic toothfish. Yeah. And so now that region is part of this MPA protected. Yeah. And the so it's huge. It's, yeah. it, it's, uh, it's the sizes of Britain, France, Germany, Italy, all put together. It's the biggest protected area in the world by a long way. We're now trying to get another three across the line. What's gone wrong this time? I, th I think sometimes you have all the things in line. And, and, and you know, we had John Kerry pushing so hard. We had Slava Fetisov pu pushing so hard. Uh, we've got to get back to that situation. I'm absolutely determined to get these other three MPAs. One's in East Antarctica, one's in the Weddell Sea, and one is on the Antarctic Peninsula to try and get them across the line. It took 17 years to get the Ross Sea across the line. We don't have that time now with these other areas. And, and you are slightly a slave to international relations yes. uh, more than anything else. So getting your timing of your swims, the planning must be completely crucial yeah. because uh, sh any shift in international relations and you, you possibly have wasted your time doing it. Timing is everything. Yeah. 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 Are you slightly worried that the drawbridge is slightly up with China at the moment? Uh, China are now very active in Antarctica. Russia are very active down in Antarctica. Uh, their interests in that region are, are growing. Uh, I pray that this group of nations, these 25 nations plus the EU, realize that uh, this is a very special part of the world. It's the engine of the world. Uh, and uh, just a truly, you know, I think there's some parts of the world which are so unique so beautiful, so important for science and humanity that they should be entirely protected and completely left alone, and Antarctica falls into that category. So we're just going to have a, a quick look at an, another film. Thanks, Lewis. I really enjoy it. As you can see, I'm enjoying myself. I don't know about everyone else at the moment. We're going to quickly have a, a quick look at a World Economic Forum um, video. Joe, is it all right that we've got that ready to go? And this just gives a bit more context to some of the work. Um, uh, that Lewis has been doing and some context to why you're at COP at the moment. Mm. I've never seen icebergs as big as this before. Uh, some of them were over a kilometre tall. The reason why I do that is not to try and be bravado, but it's, it's carrying a message. Uh, and it's urging world leaders now, political, business, community leaders, to be courageous. One short word, painful. Okay, painful. You can't get into the water unless you're mentally prepared to get into that type of water because everything, when you look around you, there are icebergs and there's brash ice and everything is telling you you shouldn't be getting in there. We set the times uh, on each swim for about 10 minutes. So I would swim as hard as I could and at the end of the 10 minutes, I'm out the water and then very, very quickly, they've got to dry me. They've got to put me into a, a sleeping bag three hot water bottles, hot chocolate, and then it takes about two hours for me to properly recover again. And once I've done that, then it's the afternoon and then I've got the second session. So it was unrelenting. When you have been really, really, really cold, 
you never forget it. It's deep in your bones and you remember it so vividly. And at the mouth, at the end of this fjord, uh, there were a number of very, very large icebergs, huge icebergs, which were grounded, stuck on the seabed. And they were preventing all these other icebergs from going out to sea. And then I remember opening my curtains at 4 a.m. in the morning, getting ready for the swim, and one of these icebergs dislodged. And I have never in my life seen anything like it. I've been operating in the Arctic since 2003. It, to say it was like a dam breaking, exploding would be, would minimize it. It was like an explosion. Thousands and thousands and thousands of icebergs pouring out. It was like a motorway. This is perhaps the most important conference of our lifetime. Protecting the planet now is the defining issue of our generation. Um, and my message to world leaders there will be, we need to uh, get all hands on deck. I cringe when I hear world leaders making promises for 2050 or 2060, when we know perfectly well they won't be around there to deliver it. We need action now. The sad reality is the glaciers are now moving quicker than our political leaders. Every single purchase which we make is a decision about our future. It's a decision about our children's future and it's a decision about the animal kingdom. So um, we arrive here, you've been swimming I think you did the swim in the Thames over 18 years ago. You swam the length of the Thames. Yes. Um, the first human being to swim in the North Pole, a, a mile or a kilometre? Kilometre. Kilometre. Yeah. Um, are you getting a bit fed up that we're here at this time now? Are you surprised that we're still at this point? Yes. Can you expand on that so my question goes on a bit longer? <laughs> um, I am because it was so clear to me in 2007 when we arrived at the North Pole yeah. that everything had changed. So we arrived at the North Pole and everywhere we could see these large open patches of sea. Yeah. Everywhere. So this was 2007. And it was abundantly obvious to everybody on that ship. So this was the first time in, in human history that it, that it opened like that, that things were changing. When I did my first swim in the Arctic was in 2003, on the edge of the ice packs. The water there was three degrees centigrade. I went back there recently, it's no longer three degrees, it's now 10 degrees. That's, in, that's the summer temperature. Exactly the same place, so north of the island of Spitsbergen, same time of year, August, July, August, and, and that difference between three and 10 is over 12 years. So it was, it was so clear to me. Is that the most? And, 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 I, I, and there have been so many diplomats working so hard, and there have been so many scientists working so hard, and so many people in, in, in environmental campaigners working so hard, but I have felt a little bit like a voice in the wilderness, literally in the wilderness, and when are people really gonna get that our futures will be determined in the polar regions. And um, there's an interesting piece because, I, and I think Slava said it, better to have seen once yes. than heard a hundred times. What an amazing, I love that quote. I mean, that, I considering where we are here today with all the politicians, that must ring, never ring truer at the moment. Well, if you think of this country, we've got over 650 members of parliament. We've got over 700 lords. We've got 20 members of cabinet. How many of them have been to the Arctic? Are you actually asking me? I, I actually don't. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's uh, how many have you taken to the, have you taken any to the Arctic? I, I recently took Lord Macdonald to the, okay. to the Arctic to see it. So he used to be the head of the diplomatic service. But it's only a handful that have ever been to the polar regions. Can you imagine a situation for example, with Afghanistan, just to use that as an example, where so few had ever been there. Mm. 
They were constantly going there to understand the situation and to evaluate Britain's role in that area. Okay? Our futures are going to be determined there. We need them to understand it. And when you see uh, what's happening there, you realize very, very clearly that we now need to take action. And what was the significance geographically of the swim you've just done? Um, uh, so the Alulasat Glacier uh, is now the fastest moving glacier in the world. It's now moving at a speed of 40 meters per day. And uh, so I wanted to do a swim just before COP mm -hmm. uh, to sort of highlight the speed and the scale of the crisis. And, and as I described, on, on day four of the expedition, I woke up very, very early in the morning and I opened the curtains to my room and I saw one of these icebergs rotate. So I want you to imagine a long fjord, and the fjord is 60 kilometers long. And at the mouth of the fjord, the seabed gets very, very shallow. And these icebergs are a kilometer tall. And they had dammed up 60 kilometers worth of icebergs, thousands and thousands and thousands of icebergs. And I watched as one of them rotated, and it just collapsed, and then within seconds, there were thousands of these icebergs just pouring out into the sea. Uh, and within, within probably half an hour, they were, they were at least 10 kilometers out to sea. As far as I could see, there were thousands and thousands of icebergs. The following day, they were 50 kilometers away. And then you realize that you've got all that ice now, so that, that's freed it up, and now more ice is going to move down the valley, down into the glacier. That, that field is 60 kilometers long, it's over 10 kilometers wide, all that just going straight into that sea. And that is one glacier in one part of the Arctic. And so what's your message as you come with that first, that site that uh, have seen this? What's your message to everyone at COP? It's actually because it's not just to the leaders. Mm. Obviously, our political leaders have huge power, but it's, all, it's to all of us, really. I, I don't think we should isolate this to a message to political leaders, it's a message to all of us. Yeah, I mean, I alluded to it there, you know, earlier on this week when I, when, you know, when I heard nations making commitments for 2050, 2060, and even 2070, I realized that they're not on top of the science. There's not a political leader in the world, there's not a business leader in the world that will not make a commitment for 2050, 2060, okay? But they won't be here to deliver it. And yes, commitments are important and planning long term is important and getting your planning right is, is essential. And consensus is important. Getting people to agree to things is important. But by far the most important thing now is action, urgent action. And every single country is going to have to get on board. Every single business, every single business sector is going to have to get on board. And all of us. Mm. And ultimately, political leaders respond to citizens. And we've got to make it known, and I think we've done a fairly good job here in COP, that we want change. And the same when it comes to businesses. You know, businesses can move so much quicker because they respond. Because if you don't like what a business is doing, you can just use another business. So they have to respond a lot quicker. But it's going to be every single sector, from transport to food to, to aviation, you name it. it, it yeah, I mean, it, Peter Frankopan, the head of global history at Oxford said the only thing that really changes the structure of society is either war or pandemic, mm. um, which is pretty worrying because at the moment, actually, we should be on a war footing mm. in some sort of way. You, do you get a sense that, uh, that the, that power of a mind you talked about, the power of a made-up mind, do you, do you believe the politicians are moving that way? It's interesting because this relates to language. You know, we, we, I've heard politicians talking about the climate change. They keep talking about climate change, and some of them are talking about a climate crisis, and some of them are talking about a climate emergency. Yes, it is all of those, but it's moved way past that now. It's now an environmental emerg uh, uh, catastrophe. And, and I say that, you know, I'm 51 years old. In my lifetime, we've lost nearly 70% of the world's wildlife. Think about that. Nearly 70% of the world's wildlife have gone in my lifetime. If that is not a catastrophe, I don't know what. And when we start talking about climate change or, or climate crisis or an emergency, it would suggest that you need to have a response. 
but it's, it's not coming yet. Do you think for all of us that are sitting here, sometimes the language, the hyperbole um, used and the drama of the language and the scope and scale of the crisis, that it's very difficult for an individual to feel, oh, I can do something about this. Because when it, someone says, oh, we've got to reduce the temperature of the earth by kind of 1.5 degrees, you, you kind of can sit at home and go, that's definitely not my problem. That sounds really big. Do you think we need to change? Because behavior change is so vital. Yep. All our behavior change is so vital. Do you think we need to kind of have a look at the, sometimes the language, maybe deconstruct some of the language we use a little bit? Well, the interesting thing is I, I don't think our language has been hard enough because I think we should stop talking about climate change and stop talking about a climate crisis and start talking about an environmental catastrophe because, because that is what it is. Uh, for members of the public, I, I would say this. We're hearing so much about what's happening to the environment now, and, and it can be overwhelming. But I ask the public, please, to bear with us and get involved and keep listening because this is really important. This is our future, and it's our children's future, and the future of the whole of the animal kingdom and we have this one opportunity now to turn the ship around and head into the right direction who wants to have filthy rivers who wants to have dirty air who wants to see all these animals going extinct none of us but if we are able to transform the way our relationship with the environment now if we're able to do that we have a bright future but it's going to involve all of us getting involved. So to, to disengage is the worst possible outcome. Um, well, listen, I, I'm going to ask one more question, and I'm going to come to the audience, because um, it's just really wonderful to have you here, Lewis. So as we head towards Oceans Day, we've seen commitments made on for deforestation, methane, some pretty significant finance announcements today. Yeah. Um, what are your hopes? Um, coming out of COP for the oceans. Are, you, are there going to be any further commitments? Are you, can you see 30 by 30 uh, uh, featuring over the next couple of days? I pray so because, I mean, oceans are so important. Mm -hmm. So now uh, 107 nations have committed to protecting 30% of the world's oceans mm -hmm. by 2030. That I, I'm hoping that many more are going to join. Uh, but the commitment is important. But now we need the planning protected areas have got to be uh, put in place and obviously we need the financing for them. So there's a lot of stuff now mm. which needs to happen before 2030. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to come. There's there any questions from the audience? I think we've got a microphone going around. Lovely. If you can just say your name and where you're from, that would be great. We can probably hear you. You, you can go for it. Once, once protected, so the first step is protecting the sea, the next step is actually ensuring things are protected. And, and we've, we've made some announcements in Scotland about protecting the environment, but it actually doesn't seem to have stopped anything as opposed to it is a protected area. H how do you see that as part of the, the next steps and, and what's the who, whose role is that to ensure that that happens? Yeah, thank you. So these areas are in various parts of the world, they're called different things, marine conservation zones or marine protected areas. And it's essential that they are marine protected areas. So when you declare an area as a marine protected area, but where you're not actually protecting it, or you haven't put the finance in place, or you haven't got the Navy or the Coast Guard or, 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 or nature conservation in place to actually protect it, it's just a, a line on the map. So the protection is as important or is even more important than, than the designation is important. It's important that we protect areas which are, uh, you know, have, have, have a wide representation of, of, of diversity uh, in terms of, of, of wildlife and in terms of the ecosystem. But the, but the actual protection is absolutely crucial. Uh, you know, when you, when you look around the world and you start looking at all the defense budgets, especially with the navies, and you start seeing how much countries are putting into protecting themselves from from, uh, from other nations, and you think if you just took a little bit of that budget and you started protecting the environment, that'll pay dividends. So I think naval budgets have got to be cut significantly. 
And that money has got to be come, has got to be put into protecting the environment. I can't think of anything more important for navies around the world than protecting their own waters and protecting the wildlife and biodiversity in their own waters. Mm. Otherwise, what have they got to defend? They, they haven't got much to defend left, mm. have they? Mm. Right, any more questions? And we've got Lewis here. Wonderful. This gentleman over here. If there's anyone else, we can get a microphone to you just to follow up as well. So if there's uh, thanks very much for that. Um, my name's Henry, and I'm from Surfers Against Sewage. So thanks very much for mentioning the rivers. Um, we're doing a lot of work on that, so thanks for mentioning it. Um, my question would be, what would your one, one outcome you'd like to see from COP? What do you want the leaders to do and commit to or take action on? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit biased because I live in South Africa. Getting off coal, it's utterly filthy. Excellent, there you go. <laughs> the gentleman behind, so. Hi Lewis, my name's Richard. Um, this is a bit more of a personal question. You said you have fear every time you get into the cold water. Mm. I just wondered what techniques, physical and mental, you use to deal with and overcome those fears. It's such a good question. I, I learned a lot during this Greenland swim because it was every single day and it was twice a day. And when you're lowering yourself down that ladder and you're getting into that water, uh, what I learned was that, that uh, purpose will get you in the water, but it won't keep you going. And that, that is because that water is so incredibly cold and it's so dangerous, and there's so many small pieces of ice which the team can't see, which you're constantly hitting up against. It, it's, it, it's, it's a very, very frightening place. The only thing that will keep you in the water is ensuring that you have a superb team, ar team around you. And to be honest, I was getting in the water for them. Yep. The other thing was that this was the first time where all the major positions in the team were taken by women. The driver was a woman, the doctor was a woman, and the scientist was a woman, right? And the three of them were making all the calls. When you're going into the most extreme environments, I think you need women there. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. And I can tell you something, so our, our driver was, a, was an Inuit lady called Annika, uh, and every single morning she would be out there really early looking at, at the routes which she could take us through the ice. It's the most dangerous place. So you have these icebergs which are a kilometer tall, and then they can rotate. So you can be 500 meters away from an iceberg, you think you're fine, and suddenly that thing's coming up underneath you, and it's coming up underneath you at pace. So. How do you get rid of that fear? You're going to get rid of that fear. You're never able to completely get rid of that fear out of your mind. But one of the most important things is that when you choose your team, you're choosing people that you can rely on, that you know that when you get yourself into a really difficult situation or you've got an iceberg that's rotating, that Annika's going to be able to get me out the water. Charlotte is going to be able to look after me. She was a doctor, and, and they're going to be able to look after me. So you've then got to rely on that team. It's, it's an interesting question because um, I think we were talking a little earlier over the lack of diversity in the climate movement. Mm. Um, that it seems to be that um, the message and the activism isn't shared outside white people, essentially. In the, in the, you know, it, I, I say this in the majority at the moment. How do we diversify the activism? How do we ensure that um, all different people get behind the movement and play a part in it because it feels like, I mean, you can look around the room today, um, it feels like it's a global problem. We know there's diversity in the world, but it feels like this movement um, feels a little isolated. You've got to stop being lazy. You've got to actively work to find voices right the way across the world. So back a few years ago, I went to India to be involved with a, with a beach cleanup, and there I met a young man called Afro Shah. He was a barrister. He was cleaning up the beach. So in Vasova Beach, the plastic pollution was literally up to their shoulders. And he went to his next-door neighbor. He said, let's go and start cleaning this beach. And everyone laughed at him. 
okay? And then the next weekend, it wasn't two people, it was four people. Then four people became eight and then 16. It's been going on now for six years. Thousands and thousands of people from across Mumbai come out there and clean it. And Afro Shah is an inspirational leader, completely unbelievably selfless and inspirational. And there are those people all over the world in every single country. There's no shortage of diversity when it comes to protecting the oceans. But we've got to, we've got to find them and encourage them to come. Mm. And we've got to stop being lazy. Yeah, because the people impacted, there's a huge diversity in the, in the communities that are impacted sure. by climate change. Um, but it's about also about creating the voice here at, at forums like this needs to change dramatically. Yes. Well. I mean, I was invited to be on a panel on Friday, a big ocean panel, and it was going to be four white men, all British, all middle-aged, who were going to be speaking. It's two, two old middle-aged white men is okay, though. <laughs> is it three is the, pro is the point that it goes bad? <laughs> it, it, it just didn't look good. Yeah. No, I, I completely get that. I just want to talk. Can I, I just want to follow up on fear a little bit because I do think it's um, fascinating. Give me your um, most fearful moment you've ever had in the ocean, in the sea, in a lake. Give me that moment where you thought, "I'm toast." Yeah, it, it would. I can't give you one because they're, they're, they're half a dozen, but. Uh, Fear is probably important because it prepares you, it sharpens you up, mm. but it can become crippling. And I remember on that Ross Sea swim, um, arriving there, and I want you to imagine a cliff of ice, which is like the White Cliffs of Dover, okay? That's how high the ice is. And the, 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 the wind is howling off from the South Pole, coming down and down onto the water. And it was this, it was rough and it was cold and the air temperature was minus 27. And then I watched as my team went into a boat, uh, my wife went in there, and they went up and down along the edge of the ice. And I said to my wife, just keep a lookout for leopard seals and killer whales, because obviously these animals have never seen you. So they go up and down there for about 20 minutes, making sure that there are none of them in the water. And as she left, I just saw this wave, and I think I described it just, just now, just come and hit the side of the boat. The water came up and then it literally turned into ice midair and hit her as slush. And I, I just saw her doing this, and then she, she went backwards, they went backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and I was watching out of my porthole, and then they came back, and she came into my cabin, and she was absolutely frozen. And she said, we're ready. And it's at moments like that where your, future's, your future is determined. Are you going to get into the water? or not. And I knew we have to get Russia across the line. And after, you know, that was 15 years of negotiations and as much science as you can get, it was not going to get them across the line. We had to tell a personal story. We had to take them there. And I remember saying a prayer and then walking out of that cabin and it, it was a very, very frightening feeling. And we went to the start of the swim, and I was going to do a kilometer, which would take me around about 20 minutes. And I dived into the water, and it was so cold that I forgot my goggles. Wow. Yep. So it was, I dived in, and I started swimming. And after one minute, I couldn't feel the tips of my fingers. After two minutes, I couldn't feel my fingers. After three minutes, my hands. After five minutes, I couldn't feel my arms. I thought to myself, if I carry on with this, I will never see Moscow. In 35 years, I failed on three swims. I got out after three swims. That was one of them. But I'm glad I got out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so are we, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the thing, really, is that how long can you keep doing this? How long can your body, your... Um, how, how long can you keep this level of activism and personal commitment up? I will keep on going, whatever the cost but I do need to start doing some swims in warmer waters nice. now. Swimming pools. <laughs> you, need to, you need to find the public pool. Are you still struggling to find the, the local swimming pool? No, but, but there are so many other parts of the world which I want yeah. to highlight. Uh, 
that a warmer, and, and you start thinking, uh, the gentleman from Surfers Against Sewage, you start thinking about our rivers and what's happening there. We've got water companies in England which are literally day and night pouring raw sewage into our rivers and then straight out into the sea with absolutely so little accountability, just pouring it in. So um, I, we've only got a few more minutes, so I think if there's a couple more questions, that would be great. And then I... There we go. And there's a question at the back as well. Hi, yeah. um, I'm Caroline from Battery Tour. And I was just wondering that with your experience talking to people who are in the legal world and just going back to rivers, as we were just saying, do you think there's potential for a future that rivers could get more legal rights and how that might affect their protection and relationship with companies? I, I love that idea of rivers having legal rights. And so we've certainly seen that in, in certain parts of the world. Uh, New Zealand is one of them. Uh, and, and in South America now they're beginning that. I'd love to see, so for example, when I swam down the Thames, when you swim down a river, you, you build a relationship with that river. It, it, uh, rivers are the arteries of the world. And uh, I'd love to see some of these bigger rivers like the Thames, which is, uh, and you know, when I was a little boy, I used to swim in the River Tavy. I, I grew up in, uh, outside, outside Plymouth. I'd love to see the, all these rivers being given le legal status and being able to have jurisdiction and be able to sue those companies which are actively now polluting and damaging them so badly. Mm. Great question. Lewis, uh, you've spoken a lot about uh, your experience of fear today. Um, there are a lot of young people out there right now who are very fearful too, um, and we see them taking to the streets, uh, I think because they don't feel empowered to make a difference in any other way. I'd love to hear what your message is to them. I understand their fear. I mean, if you start thinking about it, this is COP26. These negotiations have been going on for 27 years. Certainly in the country which I live, the vast majority of the population were not alive when these negotiations began. I understand it. And I urge them to redouble their efforts. Um, so I'm just looking, oh, we've got another question. Um, can I get a microphone over there, please? Lovely, hi. hello. Oh, sorry, hi, I'm Hannah. I'm visiting my master's in marine science. I was just wondering, what's the biggest change that you've seen in the environment? Is it the increase in plastic pollution or like the increase in sea surface temperature or obviously the melt and ice caps? What's what you've seen uh, the most change? Yes, so it depends where you are in the world. I mean, I've, I've been deeply... So I grew up in Plymouth as a young boy, and then I moved out to Cape Town. So I remember the first big swim which I did, which was from Robben Island uh, to Cape Town. And I'll never forget it, because on the beach at the beginning were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of African penguins. I, I, I adore penguins. Each one of them has got their own beautiful personality and character. And... Uh, to dive into the sea there and to start swimming amongst African penguins is one of the treats of living in Cape Town. I went back there with Sky News to do a documentary a few years ago to the same beach, and there were three or four penguins. And it's these three things which have come together which have created this perfect storm in Cape Town. So it's serious overfishing, okay? Overfishing right close to these penguin colonies. It's pollution and in the case of penguins, plastic pollution is serious, but oil pollution is absolutely deadly. You can get one oil tanker that can spill its oil, and you can kill a whole colony. And then lastly, it's the climate crisis. So prey species have moved further away, and now they're having to swim so far to be able to get to their prey species. And now, on the west coast of South Africa, they're expected to go functionally extinct in 15 years' time. And I have urged the South African government, to take action on this. I begged the Minister of the Environment, Barbara Creasy, for a meeting, and she refuses to meet. And it's this frustration with people in power 
a complete indifference to what is happening to the environment that I find so, so hard to stomach. Um, we've got one more question here. Um, it would be great. There we go. The microphone's behind you. Look, look behind you. There's a microphone. Okay. There we go. In connection with mental health, young people, all of us, um, doctors uh, are aware of the increasing problem here, but a lot of them are uh, advising, and it's been successful, cold water swimming as a therapy. Yes. I mean, if that became more of a norm, overcome fear, uh, what do you feel about liaising with that side of things to, to get many more people on board to, to feel, it, oh, it's not for us, we, you know, we can't dip our toes in the water kind of thing. Thank you. It's been amazing to see what's happened in lockdown. So when the lockdown occurred uh, in this country, uh, people then started swimming in rivers and lakes and in the sea. And then they realized, that, and they started all meeting each other and their community developed. And then they realized the incredible health benefits of swimming in cold water. I'm not talking about the type of stuff I'm swimming in, which is clearly not good for your health, okay? <laughs> but, I'm but I'm talking about the waters around the United Kingdom, swimming in them and getting that connection with the environment. I think it can only be a good thing. I really do. And I would encourage, and, and the science is coming out on this as well, about the, the, the real health benefits of it. Not just physically, you feel absolutely great, but also the, the mental uh, benefits of, of going into the environment. We become far too alienated from nature. I know for myself that when I uh, have been in a city a long time and I haven't been close to nature, I, I, I don't feel I don't feel physically physically good. But when I go for a swim in a forest, so off Cape Town we have these kelp forests, and I don't know how many of you have have seen this film, My Octopus, My Teacher. Yeah, so I do a lot of training uh, around there near Simonstown. And the interesting thing about swimming in, I mean, walking in a forest, is you're walking at, at the root level of the forest, and then you're looking up at these beautiful canopies. But in Cape Town, when you swim in, this, uh, in these kelp forests, you're up at the top, and you're looking down, and underneath you are all the the sharks and the octopuses and the fish, and it's, it's good for your health, and it's good for the soul and your mind. Excellent. Um, I'm going to ask um, uh, one more quick question. Uh, because we're here, and it's Think Beyond running a session on uh, sports, role in climate, climate action, which is great. What, what role do you see sport playing? You, you use swimming to get your message across. What, what, what would you say to the sports industry, the sports world? Um, from where we are today and COP? Yeah. Uh, uh, two things. I think first is sport and uh, sports, men and women, and the second is yeah. the actual industry. Yeah. I, I think the industry, we've all got to work a lot harder. Yeah. You start thinking about the impact which big events have on the environment, we can do a lot more. And when it comes to, to, uh, to sports, men and women, they have, sport can go where politics often can't go. We would never, ever have got the Ross Sea protected had it not been for Slava Fetisov. Mm. I would urge sportswomen and sportsmen around the world to really become voices for the environment. Mm. Lovely. Yeah. Um, right, quick round five question. Are you ready? Yeah, go on. Neptune or Poseidon? Neptune. Squid or octopus? <laughs> octopus. River or lake? A river. Titanic or Moby Dick? <laughs> uh, I think Moby Dick would be my hero. Um, Atlantic or Pacific? Oh, that's, that's like asking a... <laughs> <laughs> Hard, but the harder one's the next one. The next one's harder. There's something very special about the Pacific when you, especially off the coast of Hawaii, when you dive into that water and it's that colour, that, that deep, deep, rich, royal blue, which is so beautiful. But then you go down into the South Atlantic and you go and swim off South Georgia or somewhere like that, that colour of that water. Pacific. <laughs> Antarctic or Arctic? North Pole, South Pole. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to answer that question. I didn't think so. I never thought I'd get an answer. So, um, just I to wrap up. <laughs> yeah. um, Lewis, you remain completely remarkable, and it's been a wonderful hour spent 
um, with you. You're an inspiration to all ages. And um, thank you for everything you've done um, for our planet. And we hope you continue. Um, well, you don't have to continue <laughs> to, for too much longer. But um, thank you for everything you've done. It's an amazing story of human resilience, human endeavor, and human innovation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Lewis Pugh, UN Page of the Oceans.